I want you to go through the whole Quran with me. Join me at bayna.tv. أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم فلما أحس عيسى منهم الكفر قال من أنصاري إلى الله قال الحواريون نحن أنصار الله آمنا بالله واشهد بأننا مسلمون ربنا آمنا بما أنزلت واتبعنا الرسول فاكتبنا مع الشاهدين رب الشرح لي صدري ويسر لي أمري وأحل العقدة من لساني يفقه القولي فالحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين أما بعد ونسى جينا بيوان السلام عليكم ورحمة الله تعالى وبركاته We're trying to uh, get through some lessons from ayahs number 52 which we didn't complete, uh, we only just started, and 53 today, inshallah. And I want to start off with a little bit of vocabulary because it'll come up, uh, and so at least we'll touch upon some things. My notes on al Hawariyin is, uh, which is a group that's been mentioned here, you'll appreciate that once I translate this ayah, and we'll, we'll get into that word. Um, I still consider them somewhat incomplete. If there are additional things to add, probably in later sessions, I'll come back to it and add them. In any case, I'll start with uh, an overview translation. When Isa salam finally sensed or could almost physically sense the intensity of disbelief from them, he declared, Man ansari ilallah, who are, who are my aids towards Allah? Who are my aids towards Allah? Qal al-Hawariyuna, the Hawariyun, which I'm not giving an English word for yet, the Hawari, the Hawari group said, we are the aids of Allah. Amanna billah, we have come to believe in Allah. Washhad bi anna muslimun. And testify that we are in fact Muslim. Rabbana in uh, Rabbana amanna bima anzalta. Our master, we have believed in what you sent down. What tabarna rasula, and we have followed the messenger. Faktubna ma shahidin. Then write us or document us among those that are witness. Okay. So this is the idea, the overall translation of these two ayat. Now let's get into the word Hawariyin and then inshallah we'll see how things are connected. ذَكَرُوا فِي الْلَفْءِ الْحَوَارِ وُجُوهًا There are multiple ways that the word Hawari has been interpreted in the seer tradition. This is Imam Razi speaking. And al Hawari is مَوْضُوعْ لِخَاصَةِ الرَّجُلْ وَخَالِصَتُهُ The word Hawari is used uh, as a term made for people that are very special to someone. So... Um, وَخَالِصَتُهُ Meaning someone exclusively like my friend, like no one else, like my person. So Hawariyun could be a term used to describe the ones most intimately close to Isa alayhi salam and thus they are called Hawariyun. وَمِنْهُ يُقَالِ الدَّقِيقِ حَوَارِي لِأَنَّهُ هُوَ الْخَالِصِ مِنْهُ وَقَالَ صَلَى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ فَمْ لِزُبَيْرِ إِنَّهُ إِبْنُ عُمَّتِي وَحَوَارِي مِنْ أُمَّتِي about, about the, Ibn Zubayr, about Zubayr rather, Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, he is the son of my uncle and he is a Hawari from my Ummah. And so some have interpreted that to mean he's especially close to me from within my Ummah. That's what the Prophet says about um, him. وَالْحَوَارِيَاتْ مِنَ النِّسَاءَ النَّقِيَّاتَ الْأَلْوَانِ وَالْجُلُودِ uh, particularly beautiful or pure women are also called Hawariyat in Arabic. فَعَلَى هَذَا الْحَوَارِيُونَ هُمْ صَفْوَةُ الْأَنْبِيَاءِ الَّذِينَ خَلَّصُوا وَأَخْلَصُوا فِي التَّصْدِيقِ بِهِمْ وَفِي نُصْرَتِهِمْ And from it what is extracted is these are the most pure uh, followers of a Prophet that have cleansed themselves off of every other concern except their loyalty to their Messenger and aiding him at whatever cost. وَالْقَوْلُ الثَّانِي الْحَوَارِي أَصْلُهُ مِنَ الْحُورِ وَهُوَ شِدَّةُ الْبَيَاضِ the second opinion is that the word Hawari comes from Hur, which means intense whiteness. It's actually the white of the eye. When the white of the eye is extremely white, you have no red lines or no redness in your eye, and it's a very brilliant white. That's actually called a Hur. Uh, the Hura of clothes is when the clothes are brilliant white. Once again, the idea of whiteness. I'll, I'll skip some of these notes. So, وَقِيلَ لِأَنَّ قُلُوبَهُمْ كَانَتْ نَقِيَّةً طَاهِرَةً مِنْ كُلِّ نِفَاقٍ وَرِيبًا فَسَمُوا بِذَلِكَ مَدْحَنَهُمْ It's also suggested that their hearts were pure, as if no blemish, no stain was on their hearts, and that's why perhaps this group of people that were so close to Isa were called, so the, the closeness and then the purity. This, the overall idea of the second case would be purity. وَإِشَارَةً إِلَى نِقَاءِ قُلُوبِهِمْ It's an indication, it's alluding to the purity or the clean, cleanliness of their hearts. Um, now, Isa alayhi salam, uh, about him, 
It's actually saying that these these are the people that nothing bad can be said about because everybody else was speaking ill of them in their society and we're considering them disbelievers and uh, troublemakers actually. Now uh, on Hawariyin, as, as far as its non-Arabic origin, there are some notes that I also want to share with you because these terms that are being used, Nasara, Ansarullah, Hawariyin, these are terms that are familiar to the Syriac Christians, the Arab Christians of the region. And generally, um, the word for Christians, even at the time, was Masihiyin. And that's not used in the Quran. Masihiyin, obviously, coming from what word? Masih, meaning so those who declare you know, Jesus you know, Lord. And in a sense, Lord is similar to King. And Masih, one of its meanings is King. So people of the King is Masihiyin. Uh, but Quran doesn't use that term. It uses the word Nasara, which was used by a select group as we get into the notes, we'll see. So it's it's probably beneficial to learn some of the non-Arabic origins of the word Hawariyin and how that resonated with the Christians that were the audience of these ayat. The term disciples, methetai, in Greek uh, Gospels and in the Talmidim are also called Talmidim or pupils, pupils in Arabic, which is Talmid in Arabic, right? Talmidim is in the Hebrew. Was originally Habarin, Habarin, in Aramaic, pronounced Havarin, which is similar to what word? Hawariyin. So students, pupils, um, you know, disciples are called Hawariyin. It should be noted that the Quranic term al Hawariyun was not heard from the Arabs before the Quran, and in the absence of any writings by the disciples in their own vernacular, none except the eternal witness Allah could have known that. Furthermore, the term al Hawariyun comes from the Arabic trilateral ha wa ra, which means to come back, to return. The word Huwar uh, means a camel suckling, just as the baby camels never wander too far from their mother due to their unceasing need for suckling, so too the disciples were Je of Jesus were very close around him, benefiting from his knowledge and wisdom. They never left his side and they were closely bonded to him. By the way, there's, I don't know if I mentioned this parallel to you before, but um, Surah Ali Imran necessarily and, and other places in Quran and more, more indirectly make a very direct like comparison between Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa and Isa salam in many aspects of their lives. Uh, and this is one of them. Sticking to, to Isa salam even at the expense of their own lives, defending him. And that's actually in the Gospels when the, when the Roman soldiers came to get Jesus, that his disciples were actually surrounding him, hovering around him, and some even drew their sword and cut off one of the servant's ears. And that's when he told them to, to back off. So actually, this idea of them almost for serving as a human shield around Isa salam is alluded to in the Bible. It's talked about in the Bible. And that's how, you know, how much more physically can you be stuck to someone and close to them than that, right? And you'll notice later on in the surah, Al-Imran, Rasulullah is going to be described. So, you know, uh, the ayah came after he was, you know, he fell unconscious. And when he woke up, and the rumor was that he's been killed in Uhud. And when he woke up, uh, they had to retreat. And when they had to retreat, they had to form a human shield around him and to, to help him escape. You know, and so there's, there are these parallels that are deliberate in the surah between Isa salam and Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. وَإِذْ أَوْحَيْتَ إِلَى الْحَوَارِيِّينَ أَنْ آمِنُوا بِي وَبِرَسُولِي قَالُوا آمَنَّا وَشْهَدْ بِأَنَّا مُسْلِمُونَ Anyway, um, وَلَمَّا كَانَ الْمَقْصُودِ ثَبَاتَ الْأَنْصَارِ مَعَهُمْ إِلَى أَنْ يَتِمَّ أَمْرَهُ عَبْرَ عَنْ ذَلِكَ بِصِلَةٍ دَلَّتْ عَلَى تَضْمِينِ هَذِهِ الْكَلِمَةِ كَلِمَةً تُوَافِقْ الصِّلَةِ Let me just explain what he is referring to now. Isa alayhi salam says, مَنْ أَنْصَارِي إِلَى اللَّهِ Who are going to be my aides heading towards Allah. إِلَى Allah actually creates kind of a direction. My destination is Allah. My destination is Allah. And I want your destination to be Allah too. وَأَنَّا إِلَى رَبِّكَ الْمُنْتَهَى that the final destination is actually towards your Rabb, to your master. Those words, anna ila rabbika al-muntaha, are really interestingly attributed to two scriptures, the, you know, amlam yunabba bima fi suhuf Musa wa Ibrahim al wafa. Haven't they been told about what the scriptures were of the, the scriptures of Musa and Ibrahim, alayhim as -salam. And Musa and Ibrahim, alayhi salam, are really important because Isa, alayhi salam, when he speaks to the people, he refers to the fact that he's confirming the revelation of Musa and then he reminds them that they have lost their way from the way of Ibrahim. That's even mentioned in the Bible. And then in that, the, the, the few things that are in common between the scripture given to Ibrahim and Musa السلام, one of them is anna ila rabbikal muntaha that the final end is towards your Rabb. And he's calling on that and saying man ansari ilallah who are going to be my aides 
towards Allah. Allah is your final goal, not victory, not defeating someone else. It is only and only Allah. And so he says, Man ansari ila Allah. And the, the word Nusra means someone who's going to provide mighty aid. Uh, and you ask for aid from a king, you ask for aid from a mighty military, etc. But he's asking for that kind of aid from just believers. This is very powerful because to Allah, people with strong iman are stronger than any army. To Allah, people of great faith, they may not have uh, military might, economic might, social might, influence, none of those things, but they to Allah are more powerful than anyone else. Which is interesting because, you know, you, you know the idea of you're only as important as the people you know, connections, right? So somebody feels important because they feel connected to someone else. Hey, by the way, that's the president's son. Oh yeah, by the way, that's the CEO's brother. Or whatever, you know, like when someone's connected to someone, they become VIPs themselves. They get the secret service escort also. You know what I'm saying? And so, which is why when people want to feel important, they like to take a picture next to somebody important. It makes me feel important. Hey, can I? Uh, so I, I, I'm meeting like the governor of Jakarta. I'm like, hey, can I have a selfie? Yeah, cool. <laughs> he told me you can have my hat. He gave me his hat. I have the governor's hat. It's got his name on it, but... <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, you know, it's kind of this important, valuable by association. Valuable by association. Of course, Muslims know this better than anyone else. Everything we do is from connections. From getting a job, to getting through the passport line, to, you know, visas, to getting into a university, to who's going to get heart surgery. <laughs> and who's, who you, nobody, no connections? Yeah, no, waiting list. You know, this is what we do. But I, I'm bringing this up for another reason. Who are people of strong faith connected to? Why are they important? They're connected to Allah. Rasulullah would be speaking to, you know, sometimes elite of the Quraysh. And Allah Azza wa Jalla would say, Wasbir nafsaka ma'alladhina yad'una rabbahu. No, you stay patient with those who actually call on their Rabb, night and day. Yuriduna wajahu, they want his face. Wala ta'adu aynaka, don't let your eyes waver away from them. They are my VIPs. Society has its own VIPs. Allah has his own VIPs. And when Allah considers someone important, then they become powerful. You know, ما قدر الله حق قدره إن الله لقوي عزيز. Allah says in Surah Al-Hajj, they didn't appreciate Allah the way He deserved to be appreciated. Allah is strong. Allah is mighty, قوي. You know, right before then, Allah said, ضعف الطالب والمطلوب. The one who seeks and the one who is being sought are all weak. Now think about this, every one of us seeks something and we're weak. I'm seeking food at iftar because my body is weak. I'm seeking water because I'm weak. And every, the fact that I'm always seeking, and the thing that I seek by the way, is also weak. Water is not going to be there forever, food is not going to be there forever. If food isn't there, I'm not there. So long as I seek what is weak, I also remain what? Weak. And of course, some people seek wealth, but wealth is weak. It can come and it can go. It's turbulent. It's not stable. There's only one that you can seek that is actually strong. Because everything around, everything in creation is weak and it only has whatever little strength it has because of who? It's because of Allah. So when someone seeks Allah, Al-Qawi, then guess what they become? They become strong. The old, so Allah says everything we're seeking is proof that we are weak. Because everything we seek itself is weak. And then right after that he says, and they didn't appreciate Allah like he deserved to be appreciated. Allah is strong. Allah is mighty. The point of that is, our strength, if you want to be strong, if you want to be mighty, then actually that necessarily comes from Allah Azza wa I, I mean, I'm reminded of the, the story of the Ashab al-Kahf. Allah would bend the rays of the sun to keep them in shade. <laughs> like Allah would stop time for them that doesn't stop for anybody for a few hundred years just so they could sleep that's pretty strong you know and no no an entire nation is looking for them and instead of security Allah sends just a sleeping dog with its paws out and that's good enough and nobody can mess with them and people come near and terrified because Allah gave them aid and you know so when Isa salam says man ansari in Allah and he's actually describing that not only the angels descend with Allah's aid, but the believer himself becomes a mighty force because Allah Azza wa Jal has empowered the believer. 
So he says, who are going to be my... And by the way, who's he speaking out against? Who's coming to arrest him? Not only the, the, the governance of Judea, you know, and the Israelites, but actually behind them, the mighty Roman Empire. They're coming. The mightiest kings of the time. They're coming. And he says, who are my aides towards Allah? Man ansari ilallah. It also teach, the ilallah also teaches uh, us that it is only when we are heading in that direction towards Allah that strength comes. You know, Islam, is, Islam and Iman are two different things. That's a good time to bring that up. Islam and Iman are two different things. Islam asks of me and you what least you are supposed to do to be Muslim. Islam says pray. Islam says stay away from haram things. Islam says, you know, uh, uh, fulfill these obligations when you can. These financial obligations, earn this way, don't earn this way. Eat this and don't eat this. A few limit, limited things and that's it. Don't do shirk and you're Muslim. Iman, however, asks you, it becomes a labor of love. Right? You know, there are two students. One student is like, I just want to pass. Okay? I don't, I don't need to be a valedictorian. I don't need to... I just want to pass. And another student in the same university is there because they love knowledge. Is there a difference between them? Yeah. And one of them is staying after class, studying more, following the professor to his office. Can I ask these, these questions? Or like, they're obsessed. They want to do more and more and more. They want to go above and beyond what is asked of them as a university student. That's kind of what Iman is like. When he says, who are going to be my aides towards Allah? He's asking to go, ask them to go above and beyond what Islam asks for. Above and beyond what is, this is, these, these are the demands of Iman. You know, that distinction has been made in Surah Al-Hujurat. You know, they said, we have Iman. And Allah said, no, لم تؤمنوا ولكن قولوا أسلمنا. You just have Islam. You just started out. You've just met the minimum requirements, basically. And then he himself says, إِنَّمَا الْمُؤْمِنُونَ الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا بِاللَّهِ وَرَسُولِهِ ثُمَّ لَمْ يَرْتَابُوا وَجَاهَدُوا بِأَمْوَالِهِمْ وَأَنفُسِهِمْ فِي سَبِيلِ اللَّهِ Believers, that's something else. Those are the people with no doubts. And the ones who exhaust themselves, struggle. They, you know, give themselves in completely, you know, uh, you know, exhausting every resource they have, every energy of ounce of, of wealth they have, everything they have. Why? In Allah's path. And a path leads to a destination. Fi sabilillah, in the path of Allah, here, ilallah, to Allah. Right? So the path, every step, is actually blessed by Allah, and the destination is Allah Himself. So He says, man ansari ilallah. And that's also another very powerful notion here, a bit of Quranic wisdom here, that we are actually never going to be uh, interested in milestones. We're never going to be interested in what have we accomplished. Like, you know, for example, we are trying to give da'wah and only three people converted for like 10 years. We've been trying and we have, our efforts have not been successful. Well, your goal wasn't people accepting Islam. Your goal was Allah. And if you're clear about that, then whether it's three people or 300 people or zero people, you know, on Judgment Day, there are some prophets who have no followers behind them. Prophets that have no followers behind them. You think they didn't invite people? They invited people. Are they successful on Judgment Day? Yeah. Why? Because their goal was Allah. When your goal is Allah, then it doesn't matter what material success you see in front of you or not. You're victorious and you're powerful. I'm kind of getting ahead of myself describing to you what it means to truly have victory in our deen. What does it really mean to have victory in our deen? هَلْ تَرَبَّصُونَ بِنَا إِلَّا إِحْدَى الْحُسْنَيَنِ You know when soldiers are killed on the battlefield, you would think these poor soldiers, they lost the battle. And Allah tells them in uh, tells the you know the munafiqun, are you waiting for us to go and die? Because one of the one of two beautiful things will happen. Either we'll win, which is fine, or we'll die, which is even better. <laughs> Their view of what does it mean to be victorious is actually what brings me to ilallah closer and closer. What gets me closer and closer to Allah? That mindset is very powerful. Oh my God. It changes, it's for people that are, those of you that are involved in some sort of Islamic organizations, Islamic work, um, a school, a masjid, da'wah projects, humanitarian projects, or whatever else. When you understand this, your mindset completely changes. Completely changes. 
You're not there for recognition. Whether somebody appreciated you or not, it didn't matter. You weren't there for that. It got, you really enjoy volunteering, but you don't enjoy it anymore. It doesn't matter because it's, you didn't go there for the company. You didn't go there for the recognition. You didn't go there for the appreciation. There are other organizations that came up. They're doing a better job than you are. And you're like, oh, we got to beat them. Well, no, your goal wasn't beating them. Your goal was Allah. So it didn't matter. Like that didn't phase you. People came up to you and said, hey, they opened up a masjid just half the, half the block. And they have their fundraiser before Ramadan ends. You better have a fundraiser quick. No, no, they... They're doing that for Allah and that's okay. You know, Allah's khaza'in are pretty big. Allah's treasure vaults are pretty big. So I don't know if they're going to take something that was written for us. <laughs> but you know, when you forget that, then there's competition. Then there's you're concerned about other people and what they're doing and how are we going to beat them and oh my God, they got this many? How many showed up with their thing? You know, man ansadi in Allah is actually a mindset. <laughs> If I'm providing a service, and Allah knows that I'm providing a service for him, and I'm trying to aid, uh, you know, the Prophet's cause, man ansari, he says, Isa alayhi salam, who is going to be my aid? Now, that, another side note, but I think these side notes are important in our course of study, because I mean, I mean, the, the purpose of this study is to engage myself and yourself in some degree of tawak, uh, in tadabbur. Uh, you know, when a Rasul is there, sallallahu alayhi wasallam or Isa alayhi salam, then what they ask you to do is very specific and clear. Like, this is what it means to follow the messenger. We're going to go to Badr. And nobody says, hey, yeah, I know he's saying Badr, but I'm really good with gardening. And that's also a good cause. So I'm going to go do gardening. Or somebody else says, you know, I, I write really well. So my, my skill is writing. So I'm going to write about it. Nope. When, he, when he, the messenger is there and he's asking you to do something, there is no other priority, that's it. Following that messenger. But when a messenger is gone, like in our case, our Rasul Sallallahu is gone. Now we have his teachings left. Of his teachings, it's not one cause. There's no one thing that everybody has to do anymore. You, you, you're clear about that? There is no one Badr for everybody. There isn't. There's no one Hijrah for everybody. We are all in a million different circumstances, with a million different challenges, with a million different opportunities to do something good. What does it mean for us to be Ansarullah? Like the Hawariyun were Ansarullah, like Isa, Rasul Sallallahu followers were his Ansar. How, how do we become Ansar? Actually, uh, my understanding of it originally was there were some who argued Groups came about, you know, when Muslims were colonized and we were, you know, um, uh, taken over by European nations in the last couple of centuries, right? The French, the Germans, the British, of course. And, you know, and so, and we started coming out of the clutches of colonization in places like, you know, Algeria or, you know, South Asia and, you know, the, the, like the, the, the Dutch in, you know, in Malaysia and Indonesia and all these places. When, when they started, you know, receding their tentacles, then... Groups came about and said, we represent the cause of Allah. Join us. This is the cause of Allah. This is exactly what Rasul Sallallahu wanted. And you have to join this jama'ah or this cause. And if you don't join this cause, then you're missing out on the cause of Isa alayhi salam or the cause of Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And, you know, and when I was younger, I used to be very moved by that. Like they're making a parallel between their struggle and the struggles of the prophets. And those kinds of groups still exist. They draw a parallel between their struggle and the struggles of of prophets. My problem with that is that absolute authority no longer exists. And that just no longer exists. And the opportunity to do good, even within the time of Rasulullah, there was actually an openness. There were Sahaba that were in Habasha. Badr happened, they were in Habasha. Uhud happened, they were in Habasha. Ahzab happened, they were in Habasha. Allah created a different opportunity for them to do good. وَفْعَلُوا الْخَيْرِ You know, اِرْكَعُوا you know, وَشْهُدُوا وَعْبُدُوا رَبَّكُمْ وَفْعَلُوا الْخَيْرِ Do good. The idea is Allah will give you an opportunity to serve some, you know, if Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is Siraj, he's the sun, then the rays of the sun fall differently in different parts of the earth. Right? And they grow different kinds of plants. Your opportunity to do good and your way of aiding the cause of Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam will be different from the person next to you. And that's completely okay. That's completely fine. 
you'll be good with teaching children, somebody else will be good at you know, uh, learning, and somebody else will be good at research, and somebody else will be good at da'wah, and somebody else will be good at something else. Humanitarian causes, somebody else will be a phenomenal doctor, somebody else will be an architect who will help build and rebuild villages. Who knows? The, the goodness has opened up. So for people to take from the causes of the messengers, alayhi salatu wasalam, and then impose that this is exactly what's happening right now, it's a big jump because messengers are absolute authorities that speak on behalf of Allah. We're not. So you can't take one cause that you believe in and then make a direct parallel. This is the only cause and this is it and there's nothing else. Um, no. You know when that happens, you know what else happens? If you're not in my jama'ah, then I mean, yeah, you're Muslim, but you're, you're not really doing what needs to be done. And the people in my jama'ah are the real hawariyin. Like these are the real believers. Everybody else, I, you know, one day make dua for them, maybe they'll get guidance. You know, but they're, they're you know, namesake Muslims. Well, what do you do? Oh, you're not in my group. What do you do? Oh, humanitarian work. Yeah, you know, the Prophet used to do humanitarian work until he got his real mission. Oh, I see. That's the mentality that takes over. Being condescending towards other people's contributions because they're not yours. Oh, they're not joining your cause. They're not doing what you think is the most valuable. Allah may have opened a door of goodness for you. Again, that does not mean that is the only door of goodness that's open. Nor does it mean you're the best one to do it. And actually just admitting, accepting that someone does a job better than you, it'd be okay to, you know what, I'm instead of doing something that's replicating efforts, I'm going to drop what I'm doing and I'm going to join what you're doing because you're doing a pretty good job. Or I'm just going to further what you're doing. Or if I'm not going to join you, at least I'll take advantage of what you're doing and give credit. And when somebody else asks me, hey, I need help in this, I'll just point you here. Because you know what happens when people want Islam help, Islamic help? They say, well, no, no, we do everything. And hey, what do you think about this? No, 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 we, we do everything. You know, like that restaurant that serves everything even though they serve nothing. Right? It's like, it becomes like that. But it should be perfectly okay for you to come. Somebody comes to you and says, hey, I have a hadith question. Actually, no, I... I I know a hadith scholar that's pretty good. You could, you could probably go to them. Or this institution, they do some really good hadith research. You should speak with them. What about you? No, that's not my expertise. I, I go to them. So I, I think you should go to them too. That would be my recommendation. Things like that. Just outsourcing, basically. That's when you become good at something, then it's okay for you to cite credit somewhere else and say, take advantage of this, take advantage of this, take advantage of this. That's, it, that contrast needed to be highlighted when, when they declare, نَحْنُ أَنصَارُ اللَّهِ We are the aids of Allah. By, by the way, that actually means we're putting our lives on the line. And the, the other really subtle, powerful, beautiful thing here is that they did not say, نَحْنُ أَنصَارُكَ إِلَى اللَّهِ We are your aids towards Allah. He said, who are my aids towards Allah? The answer should have been, we are your aids towards Allah. No, we are the aids of Allah. This is, this is a switch. It says if we're not aiding you, we're aids of Allah. But Allah doesn't need help. How can you say aids of Allah? You know? Allahum mansur man nasara deena Muhammadin sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Famous dua. Aid the one who aids the deen of Allah. Aid the one who aids the deen of Allah. They understand something. This messenger is calling us for sacrifice. That sacrifice means we might lose our lives. These Hawariyun know this. We might never see our families again. We might be in all kinds of trouble. But he's not the one who's going to provide for us. He's not the one who's going to protect us. He's not the one that's going to take care of us. He himself is dependent on who? Allah, He's a means by which He's asking us to make the sacrifice, but our loyalty is only to Him because of Allah. And they're very clear about that. So they, and their, their clarity that their loyalty is actually rooted in their loyalty to Allah is in their response, Ansarullah. There's an idafa to Allah Himself. This is very important for Christians to hear because they're, you know, the, the, all of the obedience and loyalty is to Isa alayhi salam and Allah became sort of an absent third party. And so Allah azza wa jalla says, no, they, they respond, no, we're the aids of Allah. Notice this is taking us back to something that was said about the Prophet It's reversing it. 
We learned, قُلْ إِن كُنْتُمْ تُحِبُّونَ اللَّهِ فَاتَّبِعُونِي يُحْبِبْكُمْ الله. If you love Allah, follow me. Remember this? If you love Allah, follow me. Now it's the reverse. He says, follow me. And they say, yeah, because we love Allah. It's like they're actually flipping that. And they're saying, no, we're the aids of Allah. Not even no, but yes, when we're doing so, because we are loyal to Allah. So this is actually confirming. It's a case study of that ayah. إِن كُنْتُمْ تُحِبُّونَ اللَّهِ فَاتَّبِعُونِي يُحْبِبْكُمُ اللَّهِ Allah will love you. It's actually that ayah relived. So now, when they say, uh, you know, نَحْنُ أَنصَارُ اللَّهِ They say, آمَنَّا بِاللَّهِ We have come to believe in Allah. We have come to believe in Allah. You, you know, this again, He's the one in front of them. He's the one that's talking to them. But no, they don't say, we have come to believe in you. They say, we've come to believe in Allah. Like their focus was on Allah Azza wa Jal. And we're learning from that, that our, our, our zeal, our ability to sacrifice, our motivation to keep going in the religion will not be there if that, that, that bond with Allah isn't there. We have truly come to believe in Allah and our iman in Allah is driving us to do more. This uh, scary little tidbit here, that true iman in Allah, if you truly have faith in Allah, then it makes you want to aid Allah's cause in some way. Like, you, you want to find something of the Prophet's legacy and further it. And that's a result of iman in Allah. Because they say, it's actually aman nabila, it's almost a illa. We are going to aid Allah because we believe in Allah. Allah is not just a concept to us, God exists. Great, I believe in one God, I'm done. No, the fact that I believe in Him is actually compelling me to serve Him in some way. Beyond just serving myself, beyond just taking care of my material needs, my social needs, my emotional needs. I want to serve. I want to give something back. I want to do some kind of khair. This is amanna billah. And at the end of it all, they don't think of themselves as high. You know, I told you, Islam is the minimum. Islam is the minimum. And then Iman is higher. But their humility doesn't let them see themselves. Yes, we want to do more, but that means we are true believers. Nope, they say, Washhad bi anna muslimun. Testify that we're Muslim. You testify that we're Muslim. Washhad bi anna muslimun. Testify that at the very least, we gave ourselves in submission to Allah. Their humility does not let them go to a point of self-righteousness. They don't call themselves mu'minun. They call themselves muslimun. Those who've accepted submission to Allah. Those who've declared their submission to Allah. Nothing more. Whether I have iman in Allah or not, that's for Allah to judge. I've come to believe, but testify that we are in absolute submission. Also, it, it, this, this idea of muslimun is taking us back. First to Surah Al-Baqarah, and they're repeating what Ibrahim alayhi salam, you know, his Islam. Because it's, قَالَ لَهُ رَبُّهُ أَسْلِمْ قَالَ أَسْلَمْتُ لِرَبِّ الْعَالَمِينَ When his master said, submit, he said, I submit, I give myself up. He made his, the children of Israel testify. وَوَصَّى بِهَا إِبْرَاهِيمُ بَنِيهِ وَيَعْقُوبِ يَا بَنِيَّا إِنَّ اللَّهَ اصْطَفَى لَكُمُ الدِّينَ وَلَا تَمُوتُنَّا إِلَّا وَأَنْتُمْ مسلمون. My children. Israel said, Yaqub, Yaqub said, Ibrahim said to their children, my children, Allah has chosen the religion for you. Don't you dare die except that you are Muslim. The followers of Isa alayhi salam are declaring we are Muslim. In doing so, in Surah Al-Baqarah, the Israelites, the Jews were taught that the original teaching was Islam. Here, the Christians are taught the disciples of Jesus declared Islam. It's as if, the, it's as if, if you took mutation, deviation away from Judaism, you would have what left? Islam. If you took deviation away from Christianity, what would you have left? Islam. The original of both is Islam. And so that was taken care of. The origin of Judaism you know, brought back to its original form, Islam in Surah Al-Baqarah. And the origin of the teachings of Isa salam brought back to Islam in Ali Imran. It's powerful. Washhad bi anna muslimun. The disciples of Jesus saying, testify that we are in submission to God. We are the Muslims. But then I want you to engage in this uh, really interesting exercise. And this is going to take a little time, but I want you to, this is a mindfulness exercise, okay? I want you to listen to me. I'm going to read quite a bit. I'm going to read from ayahs number 19 to 32 of Ali Imran. We've already read these. We've already read these. But we're going to read them again. I'm going to read them rather quickly in flow. But I want you to keep the story of Isa in mind as we read this. 
Okay, so from 19 to 32, but now we're not thinking about Rasulullah or the seerah of the Prophet we're thinking about who? Isa and the story that I've been painting for you. Okay, and we're almost at the time where the Roman soldiers are coming in and they're almost ready to kill him. Okay, that's, that's where we are. In the in the Allah is Islam, certainly the religion with Allah is Islam. Wa makhtalaf al ladina utul kitab, and those who were given the book did not fall into disagreement. Those who were given Torah, right? At the time of Isa fell into disagreement. Illa bin ba'di maja'ahum al ilm, even after knowledge had come to them, except after knowledge had come to them. Baghiyam baynahum, out of rebellion between them. Wa man yakfur bi ayatillah, and whoever would disbelieve in the miraculous revelations of Allah, fa inna Allah has al hisab, then certainly Allah is quick to take the audit. فَإِنْ حَاجُّكَ Then if they're still arguing against you, فَقُلْ أَسْلَمْتُ وَجْهِيَ لِلَّهِ Then tell them, I have submitted my face to Allah. وَمَنْ اتَّبَعَنْ And the ones who follow me. وَقُلْ لِلَّذِينَ أُوتُوا الْكِتَابِ وَالْأُمِّيِّينَ And tell those who've been given the book and those who have no knowledge. أَسْلَمْتُمْ Are you going to submit into Islam also? فَإِنْ أَسْلَمُوا Then if they do, فَقَدْ اِهْتَدَوْا Then they are committed to guidance. وَإِنْ تَوَلَّوْا And if they were to turn their backs, فَإِنَّمَا عَلَيْكَ الْبَلَاغِ Then you are only responsible for communicating. وَاللَّهُ بَصِيرٌ بِالْعِبَادِ And Allah is in full view of the slaves. إِنَّ الَّذِينَ يَكْفُرُونَ بِآيَاتِ اللَّهِ Those who disbelieve in the miraculous signs of Allah. وَيَقْتُلُونَ النَّبِيِّينَ بِغَيْرِ حَقٍ And kill prophets without any justification. وَيَقْتُلُونَ الَّذِينَ يَأْمُرُونَ بِالْقِسْطِ مِنَ النَّاسِ And kill those who command to justice among people. فَبَشِّرْهُمْ بِعَذَابٍ أَلِيمٍ Congratulate them of painful punishment. Are you seeing a parallel? Are you seeing what's happening? أُولَٰئِكَ الَّذِينَ حَبِطَتْ أَعْمَالُهُمْ فِي الدُّنْيَا وَالْآخِرَةِ وَمَا لَهُمْ مِنْ نَاصِرِينَ they're, they're the ones whose deeds are taken from this world and in the next and they will have no one to aid them. مَنْ أَنْصَارِي إِلَى اللَّهِ مَا لَهُمْ مِنْ نَاصِرِينَ أَلَمْ تَرَى إِلَى الَّذِينَ أُوتُوا نَصِيبًا مِنَ الْكِتَابِ Didn't you look at those who were given a portion of the book? يُدْعَوْنَا إِلَىٰ كِتَابِ اللَّهِ Being called to the book of Allah. Jews have a portion of Torah. Isa has the entire Torah. نَصِيبًا مِنَ الْكِتَابِ كِتَابُ اللَّهِ They have the portion, he has the whole thing. يُدْعَوْنَا إِلَىٰ كِتَابِ اللَّهِ لِيَحْكُمَ بَيْنَهُمْ So he could judge between them, or so it could judge between them. ثُمَّ يَتَوَلَّا فَرِيقٌ مِّنْهُمْ وَهُمْ مُعْلِضُونَ They turn their backs thereafter, a group among them, and they deliberately ignore. ذَلِكَ بِأَنَّهُمْ قَالُوا And that all because they say, they declare, لَن تَمَسَّلَ النَّارُ إِلَّا أَيَّامًا مَعْدُودَات Fire, even if it does touch us, it's going to be for a few days limited. وَغَرَّهُمْ فِي دِينِهِمْ مَا كَانُوا يَفْتَرُونَ And what they've made up in their religion is deluding them, is, is, is giving them false hope. فَكَيْفَ إِذَا جَمَعْنَاهُمْ لِيَوْمٍ لَا رَيْبَ فِيهِ Then how will it be when we gather all of them for a day in which there is no doubt? وَوُفِّيَتْ كُلُّ نَفْسٍ Every person shall be taken. Which is also interestingly alluding to one is going to be taken sooner than the rest. مَا كَسَبَتْ وَبُفِيَتْ كُلُّ نَفْسٍ مَا كَسَبَتْ Actually, every person shall be paid whatever they earned. وَهُمْ لَا يُظْلَمُونَ And they are not going to be wronged. قُلِ اللَّهُمَّ Listen carefully. قُلِ اللَّهُمَّ مَالِكَ الْمُلْكِ Say, O Allah, the king, king of all kings, the owner of all kingdom. تُؤْتِ الْمُلْكَ مَنْ تَشَاءُ You grant kingdom to whoever you want. Jesus is accused of usurping kingdom. The Romans are coming after him because they think he's going to challenge their kingdom. And they are going to remain in power. And you have to declare whether the disbeliever is in power or the believer is in power. The owner of all power is Allah and he gives it to whoever he wants, believer or disbeliever, that's his decision. وَتَنزِعُ الْمُلْكَ مِمَّنْ تَشَاءُ And you snatch kingdom from whoever you want. وَتُعِزُّ مَنْ تَشَاءُ And you dignify whoever you want. وَتُذِلُّ مَنْ تَشَاءُ And you humiliate whoever you want. بِيَدِكَ الْخَيْرِ Under all of those circumstances, all good still belongs to you. إِنَّكَ عَلَى كُلِّ شَيْءٍ قَدِيرٍ Certainly you are completely capable over all things. تُولِجُ اللَّيْلَ فِي النَّهَارِ وَتُولِجُ النَّهَارَ فِي اللَّيْلِ You enter the night into the day, you enter the day into the night. وَتُخْرِجُ الْحَيَّةِ مِنَ الْمَيِّتِ وَتُخْرِجُ الْمَيِّتَ مِنَ الْحَيِّ You bring the living from the dead and the dead from the living. Does that sound like Isa Yet? Do you see the parallels yet? And he says, وَتَرْزُقُ مَنْ تَشَاءُ And you provide whoever you want with beyond imagination, بِغَيْنِ حِسَابِ Without limit, beyond imagination. What, what did Allah provide Isa He provided his mother a child, بِغَيْنِ حِسَابِ he provided him speech, bighayri hisab. He provided him protection, bighayri hisab. He provided him rizq, food from the sky, like his mother used to get food in the mihrab. He got food from the sky, bighayri hisab, beyond imagination. He's going to be provided a life that outlives everybody else and he brings it back. 
ہی برنگس ہیم بیک بغیر حساب مترزق منتشا او بغیر حساب لائت تخید المؤمنون الكافرین اولیاء من دون المؤمنین بلیورز شل نا ٹیک دس بلیورز ایز پروٹیکٹیو پارٹنرز وٹ ڈی دا جوز ڈو ہو ڈی گو دا رومنس کنسپائرنگ اگینس دا پروفٹ عیسیٰ علیہ السلام ومن يفعل ذلك فليس من الله في شيء and whoever does so there is nothing good to come of them they have nothing with Allah left illa an tattaqu minhum tuqa unless you are seeking some sort of protection from them which means that the rest of the Jewish community was not a criminal just because they were living under Roman rule you needed protection that's fine wa yuhadhirukum Allah nafsahu and Allah is warning you of himself wa ila Allah al-masir and to Allah is the final return qul in tukhfu ma fi sudurikum aw tabduhu tell them what you've been hiding inside of yourselves or what you expose Allah will know ya'lamu Allah wa ya'lamu ma fi as-samawati wa ma fi al-ardi wallahu ala kulli shay'in qadir and Allah knows whatever is in the skies and the earth and Allah is in complete control over all things yawma tajidu kullu nafsin ma amilat min khayrin muhdaran wa ma amilat min su' the day on which every person will find whatever good they did standing in front of them and whatever whatever evil they did tawaddu law anna baynaha wa baynahu abadan ba'ida wa yuhadhirukum Allah nafsahu they will wish that between them and the things that they have done there are long spans of age and Allah is warning you about himself wallahu raufun bil ibad and Allah is compassionate concerning his slaves concerning the slaves qul in kuntum tuhibbun Allah if in fact you love Allah fattabi'uni follow me يُحْبِبْكُمُ اللَّهُ Allah will then love you. وَيَغْفِرْ لَكُمْ ذُنُوبَكُمْ He'll forgive your sins. وَاللَّهُ غَفُورُ الرَّحِيمُ And Allah is forgiving. Allah is forgiving. Jesus isn't forgiving. Allah is forgiving. رَحِيم قُلْ أَطِيعُ اللَّهَ وَالرَّسُولُ Obey Allah and the Messenger. فَإِن تَوَلَّوْ Then if you turn your backs, فَإِنَّ اللَّهَ لَا يُحِبُّ الْكَافِرِينَ Then Allah does not love those who disbelieve. It changes your definition of disbeliever. It's the, the entire account. This is what I mean by the struggle of the Prophet ﷺ superimposed on the account of Isa ﷺ. One on top of the other. As if you can't tell which story is being told. Those, these ayat were not about Isa. These were about Rasulullah ﷺ. And now you go back and your view changes. It's that struggle relived. And so, here, وَشْهَدْ بِأَنَّا مُسْلِمُونَ رَبَّنَا آمَنَّا بِمَا أَنزَلْتَ Our master, and by the way, we, we didn't talk about the word Ansar and some of its origins. Um, Nusra comes from, uh, you know, mighty aid, but it actually has non-Arabic origins also. So, you know, I told you that the Christians were generally called Masihiyin, but in Islamic tradition, because the Quran used the word Nasrani, مَا كَانَ إِبْرَاهِيمُ يَهُودِيًا وَلَا نَصْرَانِيًا And then Nasara, you may have heard Nasara. That's the term that God coined in the Qur'an for Christians, even though the Christians didn't use that term. They used the word Masihiyin most of the time. We, and because later on in Islam, we became a dominant power, and in a lot of places, Christians were living under Muslim rule. So we, whether they were Malachites, like the Chalcedonian Christians, or the Manafis, the, the Jacobite Yaqubi Christians, or the Nestorians, whatever Christian denominations there were, we called them Nasara. But originally, it's actually the Syriac Christians that were called Nasara. And there are some other notes on this too. You know, in the Quran, in, in the Bible, in Acts 11.26, this is the first time that disciples were called Christians in Acts 26 in Antioch, Cristiano. And this was probably used for Gentile Christians, meaning Christians that were not originally Jews. Jews who accepted were called the followers of the way. That was the term used for them, followers of the way. Jesus himself was called Nasarian, Nasrani, Nasarian, 12 times in Matthew, Luke, John, and Acts. So the word has been used actually originally as a term, condescending term even in some cases, for Isa alayhi salam. Why? Because he's, you may have heard Jesus of what? Nazareth. So, so from, from Nazareth came the word Nasran. And they're from that region, and that's why they're called that. That's one of the origins of the word. Jews accused him of being a leader of the Nasraniyin, of the Nazareans. Because in, in a town of Galilee where Jesus was, where Isa alayhi salam was, that, that region actually was called Nasran. And so, uh, and this is mentioned in Acts. Now, later on in Arab Christian tradition, uh, in, like for example, Syriac Christians, they use the word Nasrani and, uh, and Nasara for themselves. The Qur'an has taken the word that they, the, the closest Christians use. Now, you know, you have to appreciate this even in our times. I was one time I was in Arkansas, in Little Rock, and um, 
there's over a hundred different denominations of churches in just Little Rock, Arkansas. In just Little Rock, Arkansas. Like, Christianity is many, 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 many denominations. Okay? It's not just Catholics and Protestants. There's hundreds, hundreds of denominations. And they don't, like, you know how we have schools of thought in Islam? And sometimes we even have some much more, you know, varying disparities between the Muslim Sunnis and Shias and others, right? But it's way more than that in the Christian world. Way more than that. And their differences aren't on, you know, wudu issues or some small difference of opinion. No, they're actually who was Jesus kind of questions. What does it mean? What does it all mean? Fundamental questions. How does the Quran then take all of the denominations of Christianity and talk to them? The fact is it doesn't. The fact is Allah spoke primarily to the Christians who came to meet with the Prophet ﷺ. The Qur'an also spoke primarily to the Jews that interacted with the Prophet ﷺ. And the Arab Jews were a very particular brand of Judaism. The Arab Christians, the Syriac Christians were a particular brand of Christianity. There are other strands of Christianity that Qur'an did not address. Though some common elements between all of them have been addressed, Jesus being divine. That's been addressed. But specifics of each denomination haven't been. But you know how you have a principle, خَاطِبُ nas ala qadri عُقُولِهِمْ Talk to people at their level, basically. Because Syria Christians are the ones we're interacting with, then the word Nasara and Nasraniyin, this is the coined term among them. That's the term that you find in Qur'an. You find it the most relevant to them. And what the timeless lesson we learn from that is not to call all Christians Nasara necessarily, but actually to understand that you have to use terminology and language that resonates most with the people you're speaking to. The Qur'an is not just words, it's teachings and teaching methods. And the teaching method of the Qur'an is speak to people in, with words that most resonate with them. That you can relate, they can relate to what you're saying most easily. You know, I'm reminded, I often you know, cite back to Surah Al-Adiyat and other places in Qur'an where Allah specifically speaks to the Arab mindset. You know, like battle horses galloping into a raid is not something, unless you're into Western movies, Western flicks, is not something that resonates with some, some of you, but it certainly did with those Arabs at the time. And it's capitalized. Like that's used to get a message across to them. This is the kind of language that's used to get a message across. And so when academics come along and say, well, the Quran used Nasara, we don't use Nasara, so it's obviously not relevant. No, the Qur'an, what it's teaching us is be relevant to your audience, your immediate audience. You know, uh, often I think of it as, and some people ask the simplistic question, and I'll end with this, because it's a little bit philosophical, but I, I'm expecting that people that, that engage in this study with me, that their thought process rises over time, inshallah. Like, I, I, I push you to think about things that are more difficult to think about, and it's okay. And let our brains hurt a little bit, it's okay. You know, some, when I say that, you might say, well, I thought that Islam is universal and the Qur'an is for all times. And now you're saying that it's speaking to a specific denomination of Christians that died a long time ago and it does not, no longer relevant. How is it going to help? Or somebody even asked me one time at an Eid gathering, how is the Battle of Badr going to help me? Somebody asked me that question. I was like, that's a really good question. I wasn't offended. I, I didn't take my cake and throw it at them and declare them wajib al-qatil or anything like that. I just, you know, because he says if Qur'an, he, he told me if Qur'an was revealed today, it wouldn't be talking about Badr. I was like, if Qur'an revealed today? That's like lots of kufrs right there in one sentence. <laughs> but, <laughs> but I kept eating my cake. I think, how do you, because these are questions. It's okay, you can ask a question. I want you to think of it this way. You know, um, when you study uh, the, you know, metrics, uh, the, the, the meter is a certain length, right? The foot is a certain length. And they have a standard meter. So I think it's in Austria somewhere. And the, the original meter. And every ruler that's manufactured has to go back to that standard, right? And that standard itself is timeless. It's, that's why it's kept in a glass box and temperature controlled or whatever. Because this is the standard that we're going to have to go back to every time. Revelation is necessarily two things. Revelation is timeless. We'll get to that later. But revelation is necessarily locked into history. Revelation came at a certain time 
to a certain people in a very particular historical moment. It did. And that his preserving that history, preserving the language of that history, down to the language. Arabic has changed. Arabic is not what it was. Arabic today and Arabic 1500 years ago is not the same. Preserving that Arabic, even if nobody speaks it today, is critical. Like so much of the Arabic of that time, if somebody just starts making Shi'ar Jahili today, some aid gathering, you know, Majnoon, nobody will understand. So preserving that is important because that maintains the original standard. Now from that, what happens with a meter, that standard? Are there other calculations and other advancements that come as a result of this standard existing? Yeah. The world of architecture, engineering, the world, all these worlds are benefited from, you know, even medicine, wherever. The, because the standard manage, measurement exists, now you can, based on that standard, do timeless things. If you understand the timeless historical moments, like the, that, those locked, crystallized historical moments of the revelation of the Qur'an, of the time of Isa Alayhi if you can understand them and truly understand them in their original historical place, then you're in a position to extract from it what is timeless. You don't just go to it ignoring the history and say it's timeless. I'm, I'm going to be blind to the fact that this is actually originally a standard. When you start, for example, applying modern Arabic to the Qur'an, Right? Has Arabic changed? Sure. And you start applying modern Arabic to the, the meanings of the Qur'an. What khimar means today is not what khimar meant 1500 years ago. It's a change. There's a change in the word. There's a difference between them. What will happen every few years? Or think about English. Are words in English used the same way from the last 30 years? Like if somebody said, hey, I follow your Facebook 30 years ago. They would call the police on them. There's a serial killer who's got a book in his house with my face all over it. And, <laughs> you know, what are you doing? Just tweeting. You're tweeting? <laughs> you know? Hey, why'd you poke me the other day? I've never even met you. How did you poke me? Do you understand? Like language changes as society changes, technology changes. Social circumstance changes, words change. Words and their meanings and their content, they don't just change in the dictionary, they change how people use them. You know? Something is, you know, back in the day, something is cool. Ah, that's cool. And cool survived. But two kids watching the same basketball game, that was cool. That was hot. And they're describing the same thing. It's the same three pointer. One thought it was cool, the other thought it was hot. Right? And that, and, but if you said that was hot 100 years ago, in English, 50 years ago, somebody took a basketball, that was hot. Well, they didn't change the temperature. What I'm getting at is, if you read something from 50 years ago in English, but you thought of it in the vocabulary sensibility you have today, would the meaning of the author change? Yeah, you would understand something else. They meant something else, you would understand something else. Those words are locked in that time. You have to understand 50s English, say, to be able to, <laughs> to, be able to understand what they're saying. Shakespeare has to be understood not in modern language, but Shakespearean English. Quran, its history, its language are all locked in a certain time. You first have to understand it in its original time and place. And only then are you and I in a position to say, from it we get something timeless. Because if you don't appreciate the intent of the author, and you don't appreciate the mindset of the original audience, you're missing the point. You're just missing the point. And so, when we have, we have to have a modern reading of the Qur'an. Well, take a few steps back. We can have a modern reading of the Qur'an after we've understood a classical reading of the Qur'an. Go back to the original language first. Go back to the original context first, understand the, the world that this came in first, and then you come to the, 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 the timeless. Now, on a, on a side note, I wanted to share something really cool with you as I close today. Is uh, We didn't get to, to even finish this ayah, that's okay. There's just too many heavy things inside this ayah. But I've told you that there are parallels between Rasulullah and Isa and those parallels are layered. 
to the point where even there are parallels between uh, the, the wives of the Prophet ﷺ and Maryam ﷺ. In Surah Al-Tahreem, the surah begins with the mothers of the believers, the wives of the Prophet ﷺ, and it ends with Maryam. وَمَرْيَمَ أَبْنَةَ عِمْرَانَ الَّتِي أَحْصَنَتْ فَرْجَهَا And necessarily Allah is drawing a parallel between the mothers of the believers and Rasulullah ﷺ. Maryam was uh, kept inside the masjid. Rasulullah ﷺ moved to Medina and his house was built adjacent to the masjid. And for the first time, women were actually living literally adjacent to the masjid. And she, فَاتَّخَذَتْ مِن دُونِهِمْ حِجَابًا She used to have a hijab, a barrier, a curtain between them and the people, right? And Allah Azza wa Jal says about the mothers of the believers, فَاسْأَلُوهُنَّ مِنْ وَرَاءِ الْحِجَابِ Ask them from behind the hijab, right? And then you have uh, Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam uh, being told, وَقَرْنَا فِي بُيُوتِ كُنَّا وَلَا تَبَرَّجْنَا تَبَرُّجَ الْجَاهِلِيَةَ الْأُولَى وَأَقِمْنَا الصَّلَاةَ وَآتَيْنَا الزَّكَاةَ وَأَطِعْنَا اللَّهَ وَرَسُولَهُ um, Stay in your homes. Don't, don't display your beauty. Establish prayer. You know, أُسْجُدِي وَرْكَعِي مَعَ الرَّاكِعِينَ أَقِمْنَا الصَّلَاةَ وَآتَيْنَا الزَّكَاةَ And then the angels came and told Maryam سَلَامٌ عَلَيْهَا إِنَّ اللَّهَ اصْطَفَاكِ و Allah has purified you. What does he say about the mothers of the believers? He wants to purify you. Purifying the mothers of the believers. She's described as the mother of Isa. Mother of Isa. And Nabiyu Awla bil Mu'minina min anfusihim wa azwajuhu ummaha to whom? The the wives, the Prophet's wives are called what? Mothers. There's already a connection between them, her being a mother and them being mothers. You know, she was وَبِكُفْرِهِمْ وَقَوْلِهِمْ عَلَى مَرْيَمَ بُهْدَانًا عَظِيمًا They disbelieved in Maryam, they, they, they disbelieved and they said a terrible allegation against Maryam. Has there been a terrible allegation of indecency like towards Maryam, towards one of the mothers of the believers? Oh yeah. And the word بُهْدَان was used for her. وَقَوْلِهِمْ عَلَى مَرْيَمَ بُهْدَانًا عَظِيمًا وَلَوْلَا إِذْ سَمِعْتُمُوهُ قُلْتُمْ مَا يَكُونُ لَنَا أَنَّ نَتَكَلَّمَ بِهَذَا سُبْحَانَكَ هَذَا بُهْتَانٌ عَظِيمٌ It's not appropriate for us to be talking about this. How perfect are you? This is a terrible بُهْتَان, a terrible allegation, a false allegation in regards to the story of Maryam So, <laughs> there are multiple parallels between the mothers of the believers and Maryam سَلَامٌ عَلَيْهَا down to the way the residence was. And the quarters were established, and the curtains were made. And you know, uh, the, the, the rizq that Allah says, Allah will provide you rizq. If you don't want this, Allah will, He will give you. But if you want to be with the Prophet ﷺ, stay with the Prophet ﷺ and t- accept this life. You know, this difficult life along with Rasulullah ﷺ. And she was dedicated to the service of Allah in her own way. Her, her, her mother dedicated her to the service of Allah. And the, the mothers of the believers volunteered themselves to be in the role that once Maryam was in. So some really remarkable parallels between the, the life and struggles of Rasulullah and that of uh, Isa alayhi salam. Anyway, I'll, I'll just say one last thing here. Rabbana amanna bima anzalta. We have come to believe in what you sent down. I'll just highlight this and I'll, I'll close. Our master, they make dua to Allah now. They were talking to Isa just a second ago. And they said, you be witness that we're Muslim. Now that you're witness, now they want Allah to be witness. So the messenger is witness. And now... Allah is going to be witness. Rabbana amanna bima anzalta. Our master, we have come to believe in what you've sent down. What has he sent down? Torah and Injil. Because Isa alayhi salam was, was taught Torah and Injil. The Jews are being taught by these words that you don't really believe in Torah because the original has been resent to Isa. And you reject Isa, you're rejecting Torah. The Christians are being taught that you people love Injil and you have completely abandoned. Torah. No, we, we believe in everything you've sent down. Torah and Injil. Torah, Torah is not mansukh. It's not abrogated. The law of the, of the Torah is no longer applicable. What? What are you talking about? Of course it's applicable. We follow all of it. وَاتَّبَعْنَا rasula And we followed the messenger. That same messenger who prayed the way Musa alayhi salam prayed. The one who didn't, eat, who didn't eat pork, who didn't drink wine, who followed Islam the way that Musa alayhi salam followed. We followed him. فَاكْتُبْنَا مَعَ shahidin. Then document us among those that are witness. Among the witnesses. Now listen, who's going to be witness now? They're testifying, they're shahid. They want Allah to be shahid. Previously they wanted the Rasul to be shahid. 
Go back, Ali Imran. Go further back. Shahid Allah. Annahu la ilaha illahu wa. Wal malaika wa ulul ilm. Three testimonies occurred. Allah testifies, angels testify, and those of knowledge testify. What's happening in the story? Is Allah testifying? Yep, they ask Allah to testify. The angels delivered the message. Bima anzalta. And who, who are ulul ilm? Ulul ilm are the messengers and those who follow them. They testify. That testimony that was mentioned originally in Ali Imran, earlier on in the beginning, is now the, the case study of it is, رَبَّنَا آمَنَّا بِمَا أَنزَلْتَا وَاتَّبَعْنَا الرَّسُولَ فَاكْتُبْنَا مَعَ الشَّاهِدِينَ And by the way, when Allah mentioned that, what did He mention? قَائِمًا بِالْقِسْطِ He testifies that, they are, that Allah stands by justice. And those who stand by justice, what happens to them? وَيَقْتُلُونَ الَّذِينَ يَأْمُرُونَ بِالْقِسْطِ مِنَ النَّاسِ They kill those who command to justice. What happens next in this story? After they text, testify, there's a scheme to kill them. So it's actually echoing what started off in Ali Imran, what the, the principles that were taught were now be, are being lived through the example of Isa alayhi salam. Subhanallah. So whether or not, and, and, and the, 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 the fawaid here are very powerful. Fattabi'uni, follow me. Fattabana Rasula. We followed the messenger. The mes- our messenger said, follow me. And Isa alayhi salam is saying, we followed the messenger. They, they're, they're, his followers are saying, we've done that too. In other words, the Christians are being told, you are being asked the same thing that the Hawariyun were asked. They testified to their Islam. They said, we're going to follow the messenger. Because of revelation that's come, it's your turn to be like the Hawariyun now. It's your turn to live up to the, sta- the people you love and look up to. The ones that you've held in high regard. And he says, فَكْتُبْنَا مَعَ الشَّاهِدِينَ Make, write us among the witness. By the way, um, for Christians, how important is the term witness? How, how important is that term? It's a very central term to their missions, you know? So, witnessing Jesus. Man, I made him witness. And we, of course, use that for shahada too. But they, the word witness is really important in Christian terminology. And here Allah says, write us in among those that are truly witness. You, be wit- Lord, be witness. It's literally a Christian term. Lord, be witness. Write us in as one of the witnesses. And thus Allah is actually reclaiming the Hawariyin. The people that are now attributed to be the fathers of the, the shirk of Isa alayhi salam being the son of Allah, they are being attributed as the heroes that declared Islam at any expense. They will hold on to their Islam and their loyalty to Isa alayhi salam. I'll conclude with that inshallah ta'ala. Make dua that we're able to complete our study of Ali Imran. Bismillah. Barakallahu li wa lakum fil Qur'an al-Hakim. Wa nafa'ani wa iyaakum bil ayati wa dhikr hakim. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi ta'ala wa barakatuh.